Auto Drive today we bring you a special Mercedes AMG. Meet the Indian race driver who has signed up as a reserve driver for Mahindra Racing and drive the updated BMW X7. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I am Soini Dutt. The Mercedes C43 AMG sits right in between the Mercedes C300 and the C63 SE performance models. Now, is it the best transformation in between model? Let's find out. The C-Class AMG models have played a pivotal role in the Mercedes-Benz and AMG collaboration. The C36 AMG marked the inception of this iconic partnership. The C63 AMG was so wild that it's made its way into the record books for the automotive legend. And then you have the C43, a model that has often lingered in the shadows. It split the bridge between the standard C-Class and the ferocious C63 AMG. Now it's yielded a V6 engine in recent times that was tuned by AMG, but built by Mercedes-Benz and that really upset the purists. However, this new C43 AMG could change all of that. It could be the transformational model. The new C43 doesn't scream AMG like some of its siblings, but it does enough to carve a niche for itself and more importantly, turn heads. It maintains a subtle yet sporty appearance with the vertical slats on the radiator grill. There are still extensions and a small wing on the boot lid to finish the look. However, what really stands out are those four exhaust tailpipes beneath the rear bumper, hinting at its performance potential and highlighting that this is an AMG. Even the four-door C43 is full of oomph and performance. And performance is what makes the C43 AMG tick. Under the hood, this model introduces a significant shift in the AMG philosophy. The previous, more recent iterations of the C43 AMG were powered by a V6 engine. This one, however, is a 2-litre turbocharged inline 4. This one is a powerhouse. It cranks out over 400 horses. That's only about 50 lesser than the first C63 AMG. And that engine had thrice the displacement. This model does the exact 0 to 100 time, 4.6 seconds. How fast is that? What sets the C43 apart is the innovative 48 volt electronics and an electric turbocharger derived from AMG's Formula One learnings. This isn't only about reducing turbo lag, it's also about enhancing performance overall. The compact motor directly acts on the turbocharger shaft. It can even harvest additional energy from the exhaust gases, contributing to the overall efficiency. The result is near linear power delivery throughout the broad rev range ensuring that there's always plenty of power on tap when you need it. The acceleration is impressive and sometimes it can be brutal as well, especially when you engage the race start mode. That is the fancier name for the launch control, of course, but it really gives you impressive starts and impressive acceleration. 4.6 seconds, like I said, that is some impressive timing. And then, of course, it doesn't stop there because the top speed is 250 kilometers an hour. The fly in the ointment though is the sound. Unlike the roaring symphony of its larger engine siblings, the C43's engine produces a more refined note. But it's not lacking in character. That said, even in its quieter modes, it still retains some of that AMG charm. And then of course, when you start cycling through the modes, you have this little switch on the infotainment, which lets you make the exhaust a little louder. Of course, the soundtrack is very different because this is a four-cylinder. So compared to the V6s or any of the V engines from Mercedes AMG, this one is going to sound quite different. And when you are cruising along on the highway, there is that nice purr, that nice hum that you hear inside the cabin. The power from the engine is sent to the wheels via a nine-speed automatic gearbox, which incorporates AMG's wet clutch instead of a traditional torque converter. While it is refined in the standard drive mode, downshifting does take a bit of a pause before it actually happens. To draw a parallel, the C43 competes with the BMW M340i and that one has the traditional beautiful straight six. So the soundtrack of that car is very different than the four-cylinder that you get in the C43. But the C43 has Formula One derived technology. 
which again sets it apart. So your trade-off is essentially going to be between that old-school six-cylinder soundtrack versus new-age tech. That said, the C43's focus isn't just straight line speed. It excels in providing a balanced driving experience that combines agility and comfort as well. At lower speeds, you'll notice that the ride feels a bit firm, especially with these 19-inch wheels. However, as you pick the pace, the suspension reveals its subtler side. It manages lumps and bumps with impressive poise even in the sportier Sport Plus mode, which remains compliant for everyday road use. Moving inside, the C43's cabin mirrors most of the standard C-Class elements, but with a sporty touch like the optional carbon fibre trim, metal inlays and a flat bottom steering wheel with those lovely AMG switches on there. The red colour for the stitching and the seat belts add contrast. Those dedicated AMG switches I spoke of simplify the access to the dynamic or the performance functions without having to fiddle with controls on the humongous infotainment screen. The MBUX software on the screen also has the latest voice activation technology and there's support for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in a wireless format. The high-end Burmester stereo further add to the luxurious experience. In terms of the safety, the C43 comes with a range of standard driver assistance features. With this downsized engine, the C43 AMG manages to ease off some of that guilt that comes with sports cars in today's day and age of going green and being environmentally friendly, right? But at the same time, it doesn't really compromise on the performance. The numbers, the actual on-road performance, everything just speaks volumes about the kind of car that this is. And with a price tag that's just shy of a crore rupees X showroom, I think it's priced rather competitively as well. What more could you ask for from a performance Mercedes-Benz saloon? The Mercedes AMG C43 does seem like your everyday supercar, right? Now, don't go anywhere because after this very short break, we'll get you a chat with Mahindra Racing's new reserve driver, Kush Maini, and also with the team principal, Frederick Bertrand. Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. The world's only all-electric racing series, Formula E, is all set to come back for round three in Hyderabad City in February next year. And the biggest talking point from this week is that the all-Indian racing outfit, Mahindra Racing, has signed up Indian race driver Kush Maini as a reserve driver. Here's more. Mahindra Racing is gearing up to race in Season 10 of the FIA-certified Formula E World Championship, the only single-seater all-electric racing series in the world today. While the team has signed up high-profile drivers like Edward Motara and former Formula E World Champion Nick De Vries to compete for podium places, the biggest talking point for Indian fans is the team's recruitment of Indian racer Kush Maini as reserve driver for the upcoming season. Kushmaini, let me get this right. You're driving for Formula 2. You have been signed as the junior driver for Alpine F1 team. You are the reserve driver now for Mahindra Racing and you're also mentored by Formula 1 champion Mika Hakkinen. Extremely busy you're coming up for you and how does it feel to be part of the Mahindra Racing team? Well, it's, you know, I mean, this year was busy. I mean, next year is going to be crazy, but yeah. uh, I'm always, I always welcome, you know, these new challenges. Uh, it's a new, it's a completely new you know, way of racing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a completely new discipline for me in Formula E uh, than what I'm used to. Uh, so, you know, get, getting experience from Formula 1, Formula E, and then obviously racing in F2, I can use a lot of things from each series and, you know, apply it into becoming better, which is, at the end, my goal. Um, so, and then obviously, you know, with the news of Mahindra, it's just amazing. Um, like I said, it's just such a big brand to be a part of, especially being Indian. Uh, you know, the pride and honor I feel is, you know, unmatchable. Um, and, uh, you know, you grow up seeing the Mahindra cars, you know, that's almost every second car is a Mahindra car. So uh, they've, left, they've left a massive staple in, you know, our history and they continue to do so. So it's uh, amazing to be a part of that. Like you mentioned, the, the racing discipline is completely different from Formula 2 to Formula E. So how much of the learning process is going to be involved in also contributing to the Mahindra Racing Team next year? Obviously, you know, to contribute, the first, uh, the first thing I have to do is get up to speed, um, which I'm going to start in January, working closely with the sim engineer and the, and the drivers, you know, uh, understanding, you know, how to save energy, you know, sort of 
towards the goals you do in the races because it's not all about just driving fast and formally there's a lot more things going on so first I'll have to get my head around that and then one two months in I can start you know driving the sim putting some laps for the main drivers to come and then drive try and push them a bit further uh, obviously I'll come for uh, you know definitely three four races uh, in the year so that'll be great to be a part of the whole the whole picture um, so it, it's very exciting for me as well and um, uh, to learn but also you know to try and contribute because uh, you know, seeing Mahindra's rise now in Formula E and knowing that I'll have a small part of it is, a, is an amazing thing I look forward to, so I'm going to do my best to help them. While the Gen 3 race car remains the same as earlier this year, the team has been working hard to make some software improvements and build on team strength for the upcoming season. Rick, you've just come off the pre-season testing at Valencia as well. A bit of, uh, you know, a mishap that you mentioned during the pre-season testing as well, but that did not... Uh, take away anything from uh, the testing time, right? Yeah, let's say it was an additional challenge to make sure that the team was strong enough to survive. In that particular case, we, we made the choice of having one car mm. testing instead of two because there were a bit of damage. But we had that car on track properly and then the two drivers were able to perform properly well uh, with, with that car. We know it's not showing everything a test like this. Mm -hmm. Everybody's playing a little bit, but at least what, what was really good is giving confidence. I'm really excited that we have an Indian driver in the mix as well as a reserve driver. What are you expecting from uh, Kush Maini? What is, you know, his input that you're looking for? Kush is fast. That's okay. the first thing. And uh, when I look at last year's season, uh, to be top rookie performer in Formula 2 is something important. Mm. Uh, second is that he's learning quick. He's doing a few mistakes sometimes, but he's learning a lot and he's very humble compared to what he has uh, uh, experienced and, and what he has learned. So mm -hmm. this I like a lot. And the last thing is um, he also liked the project uh, because he knows it's, it's something where he needs to learn mm -hmm. still and to learn from the drivers, to learn on the understanding, the specificity of Formula E. So with, with that package, what I expect definitely is that first of all, he's improving and that the margin where he starts uh, and where I want him to be is still huge and then he will compensate right. that gap very quickly, mm -hmm. definitely. The second is he's is, is very enthusiastic mm -hmm. and this is always good for my team right now. I need people with that level of enthusiasm and motivation. Mm -hmm. And the last is that he's bringing the young, young driver flavor, you know, you, you need that. That, that. that level of push those young drivers want because they want to, mm -hmm. to get the seat. And this is what I want also from him. You were there at the Hyderabad Epri. It was a good race. I would say pretty good race for Mahindra uh, since you finished in the top 10. What were the challenges that you noticed in the Hyderabad Epri? What are you expecting from the next race? Because there was a lot of, uh, there were question marks whether Hyderabad would make it back on the calendar. Finally did, so we are excited about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited and happy that it happens. Uh, we, we put a lot of pressure on, on Formula E to make sure that we can find agreement. But we, we did a good job, I think, on redefining the responsibilities to make sure that the event is delivered in a very good way and probably improved right. compared to last year. And I think it's an important message for the people who will come to this uh, year's uh, event. I definitely believe that the, the quality of the event itself, the way to host the spectators will be much better than, than, than last season. But scoring good points in Hyderabad is an important uh, target for us. The car looks quite suitable for that track. So happy yeah. that we come back and we'll be even happier if we make a good result here. Well, all right. Thank you so much for talking to us and good Pleasure. luck for the Thank coming Thank you very season. much. Well, we for one are keeping our fingers crossed for Mahindra Racing to create some magic at Hyderabad Race next year. We'll be back very shortly to tell you all about the updated BMW X7. Back here with us on Overdrive, BMW has given its biggest SUV yet, the X7 of facelift. It now sports a controversial design, but the biggest talking point, of course, is under its hood. It now gets a new diesel engine with an M Sport tune. Here's to him with more. Now, the X7 is the ultimate expression of what a BMW SUV should be. So you should expect an uncompromised experience in terms of the space and practicality that you want from a three-row SUV, as well as the latest in tech and creature comforts. And with this new facelifted X7, how does it manage this while still retaining that distinct driving character that everything with a propeller on the bonnet should have? BMW says that the split headlamp design is meant to differentiate its topmost offerings from the rest of the lineup. 
Sure, it'll still draw glances like you want it to, but the shiny grill and less sculptural bodywork don't fully gel with it. Still, there's a definite dose of aggression with the new blacked out sections in the bumper, which continues to the sides as well with the 21 inch M Sport wheels with a simple but athletic look. The mildly revised rear section of the X7 is less controversial in our books. The wide lighting has been lightly revised to carry the new 3D L shaped light signature, while there's a more aggressive bumper design highlighted by a chunky set of exhaust tips. Now, if you know what BMW has been doing with its models lately, whatever has happened in this facelift to the X7 will be of no real surprise to you too. So to start with, the main change is quite apparent. It's this huge curved display where you have a 14.9 inch central touchscreen and a new 12.3 inch driver's display. And there's also a head up display now, which is quite functional. Like in the X5 and the i7, you now have this new design for the sort of central panel with this Ambient lighting motif, which, like we also mentioned in X5 review, looks a bit out there at first, but at night, with the whole ambient lighting package, it works just fine. The iDrive 8 infotainment carries on with its smartphone-like widget-based layout. You still have to deal with the slightly convoluted menus and climate controls in this particular example, but the updated iDrive 8.5 will eventually roll out to these SUVs via software updates. That said, this older setup with the new toggle type selector that the X7 now gets and with the crystal rotary dials and hard buttons for the major menus is still the best interpretation of this operating system we've seen. You get captain seats in this X-Drive 40D M Sport variant. And yeah, like the front seats, they're very well done up. You have quite a bit of under thigh support. The cushioning is just right. It's got a nice contouring to it. So you're held in place while traveling. So even when the car is say cornering, you'll still be held in place with these good side bolsters with a lot of support, a nice soft headrest. And yeah, of course, in terms of space, I've pushed this seat as far forward as possible. Maybe a boss function like how you have in quite a few SUVs nowadays would have helped. But as it stands, this is, as you can see, there's more than enough leg room and a reasonably good amount of headroom. And now to come to the amenities, now, of course, you have this party trick, you can't miss this and it never gets old. This and you can also control the sunroof, which by the way has those illuminations right in it, so it'll look really quite special at night. Other features include full LED lighting, heated and cooled front seats, 16-speaker Harman Kardon audio, wireless Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, wireless charging and an augmented display being the highlight. Now this is with a reasonable amount of space for the second row passenger and you realize that for me, I'm not a very large adult, for me it's perfectly fine. I won't be very comfortable over a longer journey, but otherwise it's fine. But you still have quite a bit of luxury even here and you know that you're in the top-notch BMW SUV. You have a separate sunroof just for this row, which is really quite special. A separate climate zone, vents here and cup holders of course, and also a hook and a charger for you. As for safety, you get some degree of ADAS functions like a collision avoidance system, lane departure warning and driver attention function. You also get a crisp set of 360 degree cameras and hill descent control among other things. A significant change with this update to the X7 is the new engine. The 3 litre inline 6 diesel is now at a higher state of tune, making a significant 340 PS and 700 Newton meter. There's now also 12 PS and 200 mm of mild hybrid assistance. We also set this for the new X5, but the X7 further moves the post forward in terms of the excitement you can expect from a diesel. The electric assistance makes for a flat, progressive supply of torque in any situation, but more impressive is this motor's responsiveness. It's quite eager to rev out, which helps extract even more of the torque available. Needless to say, the X7 is brisk by any standard, as the 0 to 100 kmph time of 5.7 seconds suggests. But you will especially like the way it seems to not run out of steam well past triple digit speeds. As always, the 8 speed ZF automatic complements the engine well. With the 48 volt system filling any gaps in power delivery, you barely notice it function. Usually, there's enough torque to not need too many downshifts when you want to make an overtake, but in the sportier mode, the gearbox becomes quite responsive to heavier throttle inputs. Maybe even too much so in the Sport Plus mode, this drivetrain adds over the 30D iteration of this motor. 
But really, if I had to pick one big highlight for the X7, it's the way it handles. To be honest, it feels no bigger than an X5 or maybe even an X3. That's how well BMW has managed to tune this air suspension. So yeah, it'll still turn in with that very confident manner. It'll tell you exactly what the front is doing. You know when you're pushing a bit too hard and maybe you should back off a little bit. The steering, again, it's been sorted out. It's not overtly light. It's just correct with just the right amount of heft and directness. And you again get that very balanced sense that you want from BMW with that 50-50 weight distribution and those really wide tyres. And there's that sense of a great amount of grip. So around hairpins, like you just saw, it's very confident. Even the body roll for something this large, it's well controlled. Of course, it will lean, but it's never alarming or never, you know, taking away from the driving experience. But you also notice that this slightly longer wheelbase and the wider track give this X7 a great amount of high speed stability. So you have that very planted, that very solid feeling, way past triple digit speeds. So when you do the long distances that this diesel is very well capable of, the X7 is a truly comfortable machine, even when you don't want to take things hard and fast, when you want to just relax, you're on a road trip or something or an office trip, it'll do that job perfectly as well. Priced at Rs 1.53 crore, the BMW X7 is about as complete a package as you might find at this price. Surprisingly, it's no less agile than its smaller sibling. The diesel powertrain is efficient but still exciting enough to extract the most out of this package. But this big BMW also does the luxury bit very well. The looks may not sit with everyone, but the plush cabin and the space and practicality on offer in the second and third rows are hard to argue with. That's a wrap on this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through our various social media platforms and you can write to us on our YouTube channel as well. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.